On March 25th, 1957, the European Economic Community was founded, which would later evolve into the European Union. The EEC was founded by Europeans, resolved to no longer suffer from fratricidal war, but instead to come together in a great union, which would make them the most powerful bloc on Earth. And to this day, the European Union stands strong, with 27 members and further plans of expansion. But the idea, specifically the ideology of pan-Europeanism, existed long before the EEC was formed. The first international organization to advocate for the unification of Europe was the Pan-European Union, formed in 1923 by the Austrian-Japanese politician and philosopher Count Richard von Kudenhove Kalergi. Kalergi could even be considered the father of the modern idea of the United Europe, and his work and writings influenced the creation of the European Union as we know it today. But Kalergi is not without controversy, specifically among alt-right and white supremacist circles. He is the central figure of a conspiracy theory called the Kalergi Plan, which is tied to the already existing theory of the Great Replacement, the belief that in a few years or decades, white people in Europe and America will become a minority and replace with individuals of non-European origin. The Kalergi Plan conspiracy claims that this idea of destroying the white race in Europe is an organized effort that has existed since the 1920s, with the mastermind behind it being Kalergi himself. The evidence cited for this comes from a page in Kalergi's book Practical Idealism from 1925, in which Kalergi writes, quote, The humans of the distant future will be of mixed heritage. The races and castes of today will succumb to the increasing transcendence of space, time, and prejudice. The Eurasian black race of the future, resembling the ancient Egyptians in appearance, will replace the diversity of nations with a diversity of personalities. And it is from this statement that they drew the conclusion that the destruction of the white race in Europe has been in the works long before the European Union was formed, replacing the white race with a bizarro blended race of all peoples. I myself have always been kind of sympathetic to the idea of a united Europe, drawing my views mainly from Otto von Habsburg, who also served as the president of the aforementioned pan-European Union after Kalergi but I was still interested in the character of Kalergi himself, and what his views really were. So, I started investigating for myself, not only going through his book Practical Idealism, but also a few other of his books to get a clearer picture and refute the Kalergi plan. I would also like to extend my thanks to my friend Audan Hill, who helped me in the research for this video, and who is a much better expert on Kalergi and his work than me. And now, we first have to look at and analyze the work where this conspiracy comes from. When you search up the English version of Practical Idealism, you will be met with books like this, Practical Idealism, the Kalergi Plan to Destroy European Peoples. So what is Practical Idealism about? Well, it's a book in which Kalergi discusses many topics, like aristocracy, technology, pacifism, religion, and so on. It is essentially a book filled with Kalergi's philosophical essays on numerous topics. And this great plan of the destruction of European peoples appears only one time in a chapter called Inbreeding Crossbreeding early on in the book, which covers only four pages. Yes, the grand plan to exterminate the white race is covered in only four pages out of almost 200 and is never mentioned again. Naturally, I was a bit skeptical of the English translation, so instead I managed to find the original German version of Practical Idealism online to get the full picture on what Kalergi is talking about, and this is my analysis of the chapter. As the title of the chapter may suggest, Kalergi focuses on comparing individuals with a pure heritage, as he calls it inbreeding, don't confuse that with close relative inbreeding, and individuals with a mixed heritage, or as he calls it crossbreeding. And the point of the chapter is outlining the characteristics and traits both kinds of individuals have. 
in the chapter, he never explicitly states that, for example, people of a mixed heritage are inherently superior and better than people of pure heritage, or vice versa. He actually gives a very balanced account of both types, citing both their pros and cons, and eventually he would come to this conclusion. Quote, Inbreeding strengthens the character, but weakens the soul. Crossbreeding weakens the character, but strengthens the soul. Where inbreeding and crossbreeding meet under favorable circumstances, they produce the highest type of human, combining the strongest character with the keenest intellect. Where inbreeding and crossbreeding occur under unfavorable circumstances, they create types of degeneration with weak character and dull intellect. It is then right after this paragraph that Kalurgi would write his infamous paragraph about the future of humanity being of mixed heritage, and he would conclude the chapter with, quote, The precursor to the planetary human of the future in modern Europe is the Russian, as a Slavic-Tatar-Finnish hybrid, because among all European peoples, he possesses the least racial distinction. He is the typical individual with multiple souls, having a broad, rich, all-encompassing spirit. His strongest antithesis is the insular Briton, the highly cultivated single-souled individual, whose strength lies in character, will, and singularity. To him, modern Europe owes its most cohesive, perfected type, the gentleman. The entire Kalurgi plan revolves around the fact that he saw racially mixed people as superior and wants them to dominate the world in Europe, but in the chapter Kalurgi clearly points out both the cons and pros of inbreeding and crossbreeding, never explicitly stating that one is better. In the end, that is what the chapter is about, the philosophical analysis and comparison of people who have a mixed and pure heritage, and Kalurgi gives a very balanced take. But if that is the case, then what is up with Kalurgi saying how the man of the future will be of mixed heritage? Well, the answer is very simple. He is just making a prediction, and advocating for something and predicting it are two entirely separate concepts. Nowhere in this entire chapter did Kalurgi ever imply that this is a future he wants and advocates for. It is the equivalent of saying that a white supremacist supports the Great Replacement because he said that Europe will become Muslim majority in the future. Sometimes you will see the quote containing the word should, when in reality, if you look at the original German version of practical idealism, Kalurgi uses the term wird, which means will. Again, nowhere in this chapter does Kalurgi claim that this is his ideal future, but instead he is just making a prediction and analyzing how this future would look like. To sum it up briefly, in Practical Idealism, Kalurgi talks about individuals with a pure and mixed heritage, comparing them and pointing out their pros and cons without ever explicitly stating that one is superior over the other. And he concludes the chapter with a prediction on how humanity in the future may look like. None of this points to the conclusion that this was a devious and sinister plot to destroy the white race. But as always, it is a conspiracy built on fabrication and taking people out of context. As I previously mentioned, practical idealism wasn't Kalurgi's only work, nor is it his most important one. Kalurgi's magnum opus is his 1923 manifesto titled Pan Europa. In this book, Kalurgi lays out all his visions for a united Europe and a new world order, and this work can also give us an insight on his other beliefs, especially regarding race. Kalurgi's vision is best expressed in the following map found in his manifesto, which includes a united Europe, unified American continent, and a Japanese hegemony over Asia. Kalurgi would write, quote, Pan-Europa includes the peninsula between Russia, the Atlantic, and the Mediterranean Sea, extending to Iceland and the colonies of the European states. The large European colony, located between Tripoli, the Congo, Morocco, and including Portuguese Africa, could supply it with raw materials rationally managed by Europe. One can also notice that Kalurgi fails to include the British Empire in his Pan-Europa, and the reason for that is that he believed that the British Empire was too intertwined with her colonial holdings to be properly integrated into Europe. Quote, 
From many sides, the inclusion of England is required in the future of Pan-Europa. This claim fails because of the federal construction of the British Empire. The Dominions would never tolerate England swinging towards a closer relationship with another state system other than them, so that makes the connection of the British Empire to Pan-Europa unworkable. The connection of the British Empire to a federal Pan-Europa lapses because of the impossibility of transforming Canada into a European state. The consequence of this attempt in America would be the swallowing of Canada in the Pan-American Union and the disintegration of the British Empire. Kalergi would identify three main threats to Europe, first one being internal strife, the third one being economic ruin, but it is his second threat that is most compelling. Quote, the second danger to a fragmented Europe is conquest by Russia. Russia is to Europe as once Macedonia was to Greece. Before Philip's reign, no Greek believed in the Macedonian danger, because Macedonia was then in confusion and anarchy. But Philip's genius brought order out of chaos, and after 20 years, the peasant people of Macedonia were strong enough and the civilizations of Greece were fragmented. Under the leadership of a red or white dictator, Russia could, by good harvests and American and German capital organization, again rise faster than Europe suspects. Then the fragmented and disunited small states of Europe would face a Russian world power whose area is five times as large as the entire European land area. Neither the small states of Eastern Europe, Scandinavia and the Balkans, nor disarmed Germany would then be able to repel Russian expansion. The Rhine, Alps and Adriatic would be Europe's borders, until these limits fell and Europe became a western province of Russia. Against this danger there is only one salvation, the European Union. For a united Europe, there is no Russian threat, because it has twice as many people as Russia and a much more developed industry. So the solution to the Russian danger is not in Russia, but in Europe. The next two decades will be the history of the spectacle of a race between the idea of unification of Europe and the Russian reconstruction. It is clear from this that Kalergi was a staunch anti-communist and believed the Soviet Union was a great threat to Europe as a whole, and Stalin would prove Kalergi right on the matter. And the only way Europe could save herself from the Red Menace was by uniting and resisting the Russian threat together, instead of every European country being isolationist, which would just give the Soviets free reign to swallow up each country one by one. In regards to Africa and the indigenous African tribes and peoples, Kalergi viewed the continent through a more colonial exploited view, as he did previously state that the raw materials acquired from Africa would be managed by Europeans. But by 1929, his views on Africa have definitely shifted, and Kalergi outlines his new views in a pamphlet appropriately titled Africa. Kalergi by this point sternly believed in the concept of the European cultural task, that European civilization was the most superior on earth, and for this reason, Europeans have a responsibility of civilizing and elevating other nations and peoples on the planet. And this was especially the case for Africa in Kalergi's eyes. Quote, the possession of Africa unfurls for Europe the question of race, which it has otherwise been spared. Since your Africa combines the most civilized people of the white race with the most primitive peoples of the black. Europe's relationship to black Africa cannot be built on equality, but on dominion, education and guidance. This requirement, which contradicts the principle of self-determination, corresponds to the fact of the inequality of human races. Another issue that Kalergi was quite concerned with was the overpopulation of Europe. As a means to solve this issue, Kalergi proposed for Africa to be a new quote-unquote Lebensraum for Europeans, advocating for a settler colonial system which would see Europeans, in his eyes, civilizing a completely primitive continent. You would think that in Pan-Europa, the work in which Kalergi literally outlines how his ideal world in Europe would look like, he would mention something similar to that of what he wrote in Practical Idealism and included in his ideal world. But no, none of that appears in Pan-Europa, and in 1929 with Africa, Kalergi admits and says how the inequality of human races is a concrete fact and his advocacy and methods to civilize Africa and the African peoples goes contrary to his opposed views in practical idealism. 
It should already be pretty clear that Kalurgi would be one of the last people to want a universally mixed race and a destroyed Europe. If anything from his writings in Pan-Europa and Africa, we can see that he wanted to protect Europe and elevate it to a global hegemon, to compete with the United States and other nations. But if you are still not convinced, I have one more thing to present, from his 1931 book called Los Materialismus. In this work, Kalurgi once more brings up the question of race, specifically within the American context. In this book, Kalurgi strongly criticizes the multiculturalism of the United States and especially calls out the system under which African Americans are treated, and even openly entertains the idea of eugenics. Quote, in America, one is dealing with the creation of a new race. The African-American question has stirred public opinion in the United States. The question whether black blood should be allowed to mix with white blood, as in South America, or if the races should be organized and bred in separate castes. The question was extended to the dark-haired races of Southern and Eastern Europe, whose increasing immigration threatens the Nordic bedrock of the US. The American immigration laws are a result of this sorrow. By them, a further darkening of the blood is to be prevented. Another consequence of this mindset is the social position of the blacks. The question of race aside, eugenics is also put into practice through the prohibition of marriage for those with hereditary handicaps and the sterilization of criminals, which is becoming more widespread. By this measure, the criminal instincts shall slowly be sentenced to extinction. Europe should not sneer at American eugenics, but apprehend it as an attempt to solve mankind's biggest task, the cure of humankind from degeneration, that has taken place in the past millennia. The race question plays a central role. On it depends the future character of humanity. In America, Siberia, and Africa, new races are being created, which will shape the coming millennium. Will these races foster or arrest the degeneration? For anyone who previously believed in the Kalurgi plan and took his words from practical idealism literally, coming across this passage would be jaw-dropping, and believe me, I was kind of shocked myself. Kalurgi states that Europe should adopt the eugenic practices of the United States on criminals, handicaps, and especially races, because in his own words, the race question plays a central role in stopping what he calls the degeneration. Now, I do not condone any of Kalurgi's views presented in this video. I am simply adding more context to his views on race and other societal issues to refute a pretty laughable conspiracy theory. But if there is anything this video should teach you, it is that one should not take certain quotes, like those from Kalurgi in Practical Idealism, at face value. As I presented, it is very easy to misinterpret someone's words and take them out of context, or sometimes just blatantly making up things they never said, and stuff like this should always be under more scrutiny. Nevertheless, Count Richard von Kudenhove Kalurgi is one of the most influential minds of the 20th century, his work playing a major part in the creation of the European Union, influencing people like Otto von Habsburg and Aristide Briand, or even partially people like Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud, who both attended his Pan-European Congress. And to this day, his Pan-European Union stands strong as an international organization. Of course, Kalurgi held many other beliefs. His views on Nietzsche, Christianity, and paganism all pretty much deserve a standalone video, as well as his views and relationship with the Nazis, which, spoiler alert, were not very positive. Perhaps in the future I will dedicate some videos about those topics, as Kalurgi and his other views are very interesting as well as underrated. 